Good morning, family. Wonderful to gather with you today. It's been a couple weeks since I've been here, up here, and it's always an honor to share the word with God's brothers and sisters in Christ. It's been a busy week in the life of our church. Monday we had our monthly meal where we partnered with Zion Lutheran Church and, and uh, bring 60 meals to them so they can pass out to those in need. And Friday and Saturday we had the salad stand up here in Harrisburg Farm sh Complex where we raised money for missions. Friday the, a lot of the youth went up from East Pete and uh, volunteered and they worked that night. And then Saturday another group of volunteers uh, was there to finish the sale and clean up. Big shout out to Larry and Kendra who helped organize that whole salad stand. So exciting when we get to be a church on mission. Most of you know Sunday mornings we're currently in an extended Acts sermon series through the book of Acts. We've been going through Acts for eight weeks now as we looked at different lessons that God can show us from the early church. It's kind of trippy, hearing an echo of myself. That's, is that really what I sound like? That's pretty bad. <laughs> um, however, this week and next week, we're going to take a, w a break from the book of Acts there. Um, as we enter this Easter season, today traditionally is called Palm Sunday in the larger church calendar. Palm Sunday marks the beginning of Holy Week. Holy Week is the week that leads up to Jesus' victorious resurrection on Sunday, next Sunday. This Holy Week starts today with Palm Sunday, and then many churches celebrate Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday before the grand celebration of Easter Sunday where our Lord Jesus conquered the grave and defeated death. Three days rose from the tomb. Because of Easter season and the start of Holy Week today, we're taking that break from Acts for two weeks so we can focus on these moments important key moments of Jesus's life. Today, Palm Sunday traditionally celebrates the day when Jesus enters Jerusalem for the last time. He does not enter the city in any normal way. He enters the city by being praised and proclaimed as a king. We see this in the Gospels. Uh, we will read one in Luke 19, verse 35 through 40. He's, he comes into the city being proclaimed as a king, and then a week later he's crucified as a criminal. Such a stark contrast. So we see this, the, the, the setting for Palm Sunday here in Luke 19 when we read, And they brought it, it being a colt or a donkey, to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down from Mount of Olives, so he was leaving the Mount of Olives, going into Jerusalem, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace on earth and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples for saying such things. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And so Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem Today, well, today, 2,000 years ago, he enters Jerusalem, the capital of the region, being hailed as a king. And this is the moment that kicks off all the events of Holy Week. One of the events of Holy Week is Monday, Thursday, which is the celebration of the Last Supper. The Last Supper is when Jesus eats with his disciples for the last time before he is arrested. The Last Supper's significance is that Jesus instills this practice that we've come to know him as communion. The Last Supper is the first time that Jesus gives a clear picture of what communion looks like. If you're not familiar with this term of communion, it's the term that we Christians have placed on the practice of remembering Jesus through the breaking of bread and the drinking of, of wine, or as Jesus prescribed in the Gospels. Communion is a fancy word to, to sum up the practice of breaking bread and drinking wine in remembrance of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So even though I would love to talk couple hours on all the history and prophecies and everything that happens on this Palm Sunday of Jesus entering to Jerusalem, there's also an opportunity here for us to talk about communion as we enter Holy Week. So you see, for the past three months, the leadership team of East Pete has been processing what communion looks like for us as a faith family. We've discussed for hours how God wants us to practice communion. We've looked at the scriptures again and again on communion. We have prayed and asked the Lord for guidance on how he is directing us in communion. And so today, Palm Sunday, we're going to look at what is communion. This sermon will take a 
three-step process or have three main points. We'll look at what communion has been in our past. We'll see communion in the scriptures, and then we'll look at what communion will be like in our future. This is long overdue, and part of the reason we've not practiced communion sooner is because we as a leadership team wanted to make sure we were doing it God's way. We wanted the assurance that we were taking steps towards communion in step with the Holy Spirit. We easily could have leaned on traditions. We easily could have leaned on what we thought communion should look like inside of our faith family, but we wanted God's way. And so I stand here today with full confidence for the leadership team of East Peth as we've talked, as we've practiced, as we're going to practice communion. We truly believe this is what God has for us in this season. Can we be 100% confident that this is the will of God? Have we heard an audible voice telling us how to practice communion? No, but that's what it means to live by faith. We have prayed, we have discussed, we have discerned, we have talked with many others, and most importantly, we have talked to the, to the Father. We do believe that how we're going to practice communion later today is, is from God for our church at this time. We have not taken this lightly, but we've entered it with joy and excitement because we know that God's way is the best way. I was talking to Harold Thomas yesterday, and he said to me, the Bible's way is the best way, and I have to agree with Harold. So part of our sermon today, we're going to look at the Bible's way of communion and see how God wants us to be shaped by what we practice, communion in our faith family, in accordance with the scriptures. And so before we dive into scriptures and look at the practice of communion from a biblical sense, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you are Hosanna. We praise you. We we lift you up, Lord. We thank you for this, this faith family. And we ask that you just continue to work in our hearts, lead us one step at a time as we seek to follow your will and be obedient to you and to honor you with everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, into the first point, we want to honor and respect the past. Most of you are familiar with how we've practiced communion here at East Pete much better than I am. Um, so this point will be short. Over the years, communion has taken on many different feels, from a much more stoic tendency of confession and, and with the practice of feet washing incorporated, there is even a sense of fear of the Lord surrounding it. At times, communion has been more relaxed with the feeling of honoring the Lord and enjoying the simplicity of the bread and the, and the cup. What is most important is that no matter how communion has been practiced in the past, God was always in it. Some of the ways we have practiced communion are not directly in the Bible, but the heart behind remembering Christ was always there. At the heart of communion has been practiced in the past. It was not wrong the way we did communion as we were wanting to honor the Lord. In the different seasons, the board of directors and pastors have sought the direction of the Lord on how to do communion for this faith family. And so we look at the scriptures. In the second point, we're going to see how we're allowing the scriptures to influence us in this season. I want us all to understand that even though we're going to start practicing communion a little differently than we have in the past, it does not make the past wrong. As we move forward to our second point of looking at the scriptures behind communion, the heart of the leadership team was to understand the scriptures to the best of our ability and by the guidance of the Spirit so that we can, as a faith family, practice communion in the most biblical way um, this season. And so we looked as a leadership team and, and... Foot washing has been a very big part of the Mennonite church in the past. We do not feel at this point led to incorporate that. We see in in the Last Supper they are two separate events that can be intertwined, but they don't necessarily have to be intertwined. So that's one thing that stepping into this new season we won't be incorporating with communion. It's still very important to serve and, and, and even to wash feet in that sense. But as we look at scriptures and what communion is in the scriptures for us today, um, we wanna, we're going on a journey from the Last Supper to the Gospels. We'll start in the Gospels, we'll work through the book of Acts, into the epistles, and ending with Revelation. So if you'd open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Luke. It's the third Gospel out of four. It goes Matthew, Mark, Luke. If you've got to John or Acts, you've gone too far in your Bibles. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 22. This is the count of the Last Supper. We also find the Last Supper, Jesus, when he installs communion for us Christians in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, with, with Tracy and Jonathan will share a little bit with us later today, and in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. But today, in here, we'll be looking at Luke, chapter 22, verses 14 through 20. 
This is the count we'll focus on. So Luke 22, verses 14 through 20. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the, king, until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, The cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. This is the word of the Lord. Let us walk through this a little bit, starting in verse 14. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Something to note here is that during Jesus' life at, and his time, the, it was normal for people to recline at a table. They did not have chairs like we do. They normally had pads or cushions that they laid down on the floor, and then they would lay down or lean over on their elbows or sit on the cushions. And so when this verse says they reclined at the table, it's simply describing the cultural way by which people would eat. It would look something like this. A little different than the famous painting of the Last Supper where they're all at this elevated table on chairs. This would be a more biblical picture of how they would recline. If you notice, their feet are away. You know, feet were very dirty in that time, and so they're, that's why they're pointing away from the table. When we practice communion, remember, we want to live, we want to do it as biblically as we can, um, but we're not going to be reclining at tables today. Um, in our culture, in our age, in our chairs, we, we do have chairs, and so we will be sitting at tables in the fellowship hall, just to clarify. Moving to verse 15 and 16, Jesus says, He earnestly desired to eat the Passover meal. The Passover meal was a special meal in Jewish culture, the Jewish history, and so Jesus is describing the time around which he first had this communion meal Tracy and Jonathan are going to talk a little bit more about that later today as well. What is important to pull is that it's around a meal, specifically the Passover meal here, but communion starts, and we're going to see throughout Scripture, it's often around a meal. Moving into verse 17 and 18, Jesus then tells them to take the cup, full of wine and divide it among themselves, and so the apostles take the wine and pass it around to their own cups. Then verse 19 we enter the heart of communion in the nature of why communion exists. Verse 19 says, Jesus says, he took bread and broke it and gave it to them and gave it to the disciples and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we have this first element of communion, the, the bread, the bread representing the body of Christ. The body of Christ, which in a couple of hours to these disciples was about to be arrested beaten and broken and then hung on a cross. Jesus is telling his disciples that as he breaks the bread that they are to remember the brokenness that his body will experience. But not just to remember the brokenness, but to remember him. To remember that he was broken on a cross so that salvation could be possible. When we have communion, family, we take the broken pieces of bread in our hands. We remember Christ's broken body and how it it made a way for our sins to be forgiven. We rejoice in the broken bread knowing that his body, when it's resurrected, was made whole again. And no matter how broken our bodies are, they will be made whole too as in the resurrection of when we enter glory. We take, amen, we take communion with bread to represent the body of Christ to help us remember him. It's a physical substance that we can do to connect to our Savior. In reality, our whole lives should be focused on Jesus, and this can be challenging to focus our whole lives on Jesus every moment with the distractions of the world around us, with the whispers of the devil as he tries to pull our attention away from our Savior. And so Jesus gives us communion as an essential way to help our minds, our hearts, our eyes, and our lives to focus on him. That's why communion is an important part of our faith journey with Jesus, because we need to remember him, and communion helps us to do that. Continuing in verse 20, it says, In the same way Jesus took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you in the new covenant in my blood. So in the same way the bread represents Jesus' body, we take the bread to help us remember him. We also look at the wine or the cup. And in many churches we use juice. We look at the wine or juice as a way for us to remember his blood. You see, Jesus' blood on the cross established a new covenant covenant. 
What does that mean? What is a covenant? A covenant is a contract or an agreement between two parties. When you got married, for those of you who are married or even thinking about marriage, when you got married, you entered into a covenant with your spouse. Our spouses promise to love us and cherish us till the day we die, and we promise to love our spouse through sickness and health, through good and bad. Our wedding day, we entered a covenant with our spouse. When we give our lives to Jesus, whatever age, wherever we're at on our journey, when we give our lives to Jesus, we enter a covenant with God. It is by Jesus' blood on the cross that made this covenant between man and God possible. Because of Jesus' blood, it is possible for you and I to be in agreement or a covenant with God. We mortals, sinful from the moment of our existence, can be in a covenant with a holy, righteous God. All because of Jesus. The blood that he shed on the cross when his body was broken made it possible for you and I to be in covenant with God. This covenant means that our identity, our destiny, our purpose is redeemed, it's transformed we become, in this covenant, we become children of God. And that's only because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. And so when we take communion, we must remember that the blood made it possible for you and for me to be children of God. God does his side of the covenant, folks. That's what we're celebrating when we partake in communion, that God's part was to make it possible for this relationship with him. God's part was to take away the sins of the world. God does this through the sacrifice of his son on Friday. When Jesus' body is broken on the cross and his blood is spilled out, God, do, God does his side of the covenant. And a relationship with God is made possible through Jesus Christ. No one, the Bible says, no one can come to the Father except through the Son by the working of the Holy Spirit. And so God does his part, but every single one of us must do our part of the covenant. There is no such thing as a one-sided covenant. Both parties must be in agreement and do their part. On our wedding day, did, on your wedding day, did you stand there and let your spouse make all these promises and you didn't say anything back? Of course not. You responded in some way with your own commitment to that person in the same way God demands that we respond to him. Before we have a relationship with Jesus, we respond to God through repentance through putting our faith in him by being obedient and being baptized and then receiving the Holy Spirit. Now as we walk out our relationship with Jesus every day, we respond by upholding our end of the covenant. We uphold our covenant by obeying him, by seeking to live a holy life, by being witnesses here on earth, by continuing to have faith and confess his name. We are in a covenant with God. God is doing his part to sustain us and carry us through and we must continue to do our part. Now we must continue to keep our promise to God and say, I will follow you. I will confess your name. I will believe in you and we shall one day be saved into glory. When we celebrate communion here though before glory, when we celebrate communion, we remember the covenant that was made available through the broken body, the bread, and the shed blood, the wine or juice. Communion, folks, is joyous and somber it's a exciting practice that Jesus said we must do as we have a relationship and keep our covenant with God. To clarify, the reason why some churches use juice instead of wine has to do with what wine was like in Jesus' time. The alcoholic level of wine in Jesus' time was much lower than the alcoholic level of our wine today. The process by which wine was made in Jesus' time was much simpler and produced wine that was much more akin to, honestly, our grape juice than our modern wine. Some scholars say the wine of Jesus' time was more like kumbacha, if you've ever had any of that. Thus, that is why many churches, including ours, choose to use juice as wine for communion. Moving into a few key elements that the leadership team pulled from this passage, we obviously need bread and uh, we need wine or juice. As a leadership team, we also know that the first communion happened around a meal or fellowship time. Let us keep those things in mind as we go through a couple more of the verses, overview of the verses in, in the Bible on communion. So turning a few pages in your Bible to the next, to Luke chapter 24, here we have Jesus after the resurrection. Okay, so Jesus gave communion before he died. Did the early church practice it? Did the early church continue it? Did Jesus 
instill it. And so we turn to Luke 24, and we see after Jesus' resurrection, he's on his way with a couple of disciples. He joins with a couple of disciples to the village of Emmaus, and they don't recognize that it's actually Jesus. And so they're walking, and when they get to Emmaus, the disciples invite him in and say, hey, Jesus, come join us. And so Luke chapter 24 Jesus went to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And when he did that, as he did what he did on the Last Supper in Luke 22, as he did that, their eyes were opened, and in that moment, they recognized him. And so it was around a meal, there was this breaking of bread, this, what we would call communion. So in this Luke 24 passage, we have this, this, these connections being made. Moving along further in our Bibles to the life of the early church, we turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, now okay, so Jesus did it when he was here, but then he ascends. Did the early church, did the first Christians, did they practice communion? Did they do it? And how did they do it? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. We're going to see, it's Sharon Hess actually preached on this a couple weeks ago. Um, We see in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Sharon talked about these four essential elements that are mentioned in Acts 2. And one of them is communion, or breaking of bread. The breaking of bread here in Acts chapter 2, the early church was devoted to constantly practicing, is a reference to fellowship time around meals, where they had communion as The early church called it breaking bread. There was different times when they had fellowship and gathered together that it wasn't called breaking of bread, but when it's called breaking of bread in the scriptures, we scholars and we connect it to this this communion, this last supper. Later in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 7, we again see the early Christians. So that's that's years later, folks. Years later now in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we again see the early Christians gathering together for the breaking of bread. And this time it specifically says they met in houses. They met in their houses where they were, Paul was coming on a missionary journey for just a short time and he comes and is teaching them. And in that moment they have communion, they break bread. Moving into our last passage um, as an overview of communion in the Bible. We'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We could dive pretty deep into this chapter. But the point of understanding the heart of communion, we can see it without having to dive too deep. And so 1 Corinthians 11. Is Paul the apostle talking to the Christians in the city of Corinth? He started this church. He left and then continued on his missionary journey. Then he's writing a letter back saying, hey, I've noticed some things or I've heard some things that are going on in the church. And, And in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul actually addresses what they're doing wrong. So even the early church folks that had the apostles, they got confused too. They needed some correction. They needed some direction from the apostles, from the Holy Spirit. And the beautiful thing about the 1 Corinthians passage is that we can learn so much about communion from what's happening in 1 Corinthians 11, how they did it wrong and how God, the heart behind what God wants for us. So we'll go through this passage as we look at some key points. So 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 20. When you come together, so Paul's saying, when you as a church in Corinth come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. So in these few verses, we see the Christians are gathering together for a meal. With this meal, they're celebrating the Lord's Supper, communion, breaking of bread. With this meal, though, they are not loving each other. Some people, so they have a potluck. They bring their food to, this, to the whatever house, wherever they're gathering. They all bring their food, kind of like we're doing. We do sometimes on Sunday morning. We have a potluck, and thank the Lord that we share. First Corinthians church was not. They were not sharing. They were bringing their food together, but some people would eat their own meals, and some people brought wine for communion, and they were getting drunk on it. Yet the poor people in the church didn't get anything. They went hungry. So Paul is saying that when the Corinthian church is gathering in fellowship together around a meal and celebrating the Lord's Supper, they're not doing it with love and generosity. But then Paul goes into explaining communion based on the Lord's Supper. So he, he points out they're wrong. He says, hey, this is what you guys are doing wrong. Let me remind you what the heart of Jesus is for this time together. In verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered you. So at one point, Paul came, when he started this church, he came and gave them the truth. 
He said, this is how we should do communion according to what Jesus told me, right? But they'd strayed away from it. They'd allow strife and jealousy and and selfishness to infuse and and separate them in the time of communion. But Paul says, "I, I, I remind you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, which is Monday, Thursday coming up here, which is the Last Supper, on that night, Jesus did what? He took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Sounds kind of familiar, right? The bread of his body, the wine is blood, and we take them in remembrance of him. And verse 26 says, As often as we practice communion, we proclaim the, the Lord's work on the cross. We proclaim his death. Where the door to the new covenant with God was opened. They practice communion regularly. Finishing the verse, we, 27, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup. So there we go, excuse me. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. These last verses give us an important reminder, folks, that as we take communion, we need to be in a healthy relationship with each other. And so if you have strife between a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ or Maybe I'm just not talking to that person over there because I don't really like them. He's saying, remember, we need healthy relationships with each other and with God. If we have unrepentive sins as we approach our time of communion, if we have unrepentive sins, we need to go to God and have that right relationship with him stored through repentance as we receive forgiveness. These broken relationships were happening in the Corinthian church. This is what Paul is talking about in the first couple verses of the passage. Folks, we need to learn from the mistakes of the Corinthian church so that when we celebrate communion, it's in a way that honors God and honors each other. You see, what is so wonderful about communion is that it is an opportunity for us to have restored relationship with each other and restored relationship with God. If we examine ourselves before we take communion, we give space for the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins. If we know, hey, I need to enter this communion with a clean conscience before God and a right heart with God, and I need to enter communion with right relationship with my brothers and sisters, communion is always a constant reminder for us to have repentive hearts and peace with one another. The idea of fellowshipping together around food, around a meal, and sharing communion together is even echoed further now in the book of Acts, or the book of Revelations. Revelation chapter 9 says there is going to be a grand feast a grand feast in heaven. Its communion is a foreshadow of this feast. It might look something like that. All for eternity, the family of God stretched out. Feast the Lord. I imagine cherubim and seraphim flying around over us as we're in the presence of God. The Bible says there will be no sun, like the sun we see outside that gives us light in heaven, because the sun himself, God, will be the light of eternity, the light that will shine forth in heaven as we dwell in his presence. So communion, again, is a reminder that, man, I'm eating with my brothers and sisters. I'm having this bread and this wine, but one day I'm going to be with the bread of life. I'm going to be with the one who gave me life through his shed blood. All righty, then. That's a quick overview of the scriptures um, that we talk about. Breaking the bread in the early church, they called it breaking the bread. A side note, maybe as we process and we continue to follow and step with God, we should start calling it breaking bread or the Lord's Supper. The word communion is not actually in the Bible. It's a term that has been used to sum up what we're practicing. So it's something that we we'll, can keep processing and discerning of breaking bread is, or is communion okay. Discussion for another time. As a leadership team, we process what communion looks like for us here at East Pete. In this season, and we looked at the scriptures, one, and one word that stood out every single time we talked, every single time we prayed, every single time we looked at the scriptures was the word relationship. Communion is about relationships. It's a, about our relationship with God through the Son. It's about our relationship with each other. In these verses, we see that communion is often happening around relationship meals, times together. So the leadership team processed these verses and asked 
God, how, how we, how God wants us to do communion in a relational manner, in a way that fosters healthy relationships with each other and healthy relationships with God. We felt the Lord leading us to get back to doing communion as closely as we can to the Bible's way. As Harold Thomas pointed out, the Bible's way is the best way. The Lord leads me, this leads me into the third and final point. What does communion look like for us, folks? How do we, how do we, as the leadership team felt um, God wanted us to practice? So we asked, we asked for guidance, we asked for wisdom, and God started to give us this vision, started to develop what communion looks like here at East Pete, Mennonite Church. The vision was one that is surrounded and covered in relationships, looking long-term, long-term, months, years down the road. The vision is that every single one of you here today, watching online, those who will come in, those born-again believers all over the world, that every single one of you, sons and daughters of God, would be equipped to give and receive communion between each other whenever you fellowship and feel led by the Spirit. You see, the Bible does not say only certain people, such as pastors and leaders, are the ones to give communion. No, each one of you, born-again believers, has the credentials, the authority, the power, and the right to give and take communion inside the body of Christ. This long-term vision of communion for us as a faith family is that each one of you would be comfortable within your families and your friend groups, your Christian friends, to give and take communion as you're led by the Spirit. This might mean that when you have family over next week for Easter meal, you will take a moment to invite Jesus in and host as the host of that meal to welcome God's presence through communion. This might mean that as you gather with friends for supper one night and a game night just to play some board games or card games, you participate in communion as a way to center that entire evening on the thing that really matters, Jesus. That is the prayer, the hope, of the vision that we as a leadership team have for each one of you that you would be equipped to engage in the ministry of reconciliation and communion with each other. And that you would feel comfortable to celebrate communion as your homes as often as you gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ. The early church practiced communion on a regular basis. The first Christians celebrated communion around a meal, and they did it often. Church history tells us that the early church, up to the third century, they practiced communion through meals in their homes. It was in the third century that communion changed to this more religious thing where a priest had to be giving it, where it had to be in a church service and had to, you know, a much more liturgical feel to it. But the first couple hundred years of the church, it was a relational. Christians, brothers and sisters, giving it to each other. As a leadership team, we want to get back to the roots of communion, where communion is more about relationships that we have with each other and as a way to remember the Lord and the relationship we have with Him. As we celebrate communion today, we're not going to do it around a big meal yet. We want to introduce this style of communion in a gracious and, and slow process. It will eventually, the vision is eventually to have it around meals of fellowship times when we focus, have our, our spring gathering, when we have fellowship meals um, outside of church, here on Sunday mornings, that will incorporate communion into those times. The vision of our faith community as we gather together as a family of God is that when we do fellowship, yeah, all those times that we're together, that we'd have an opportunity to remember Jesus through communion. Now today, in a couple minutes, we're going to move from this sanctuary, and we're going to actually go to the fellowship hall. Jim Booker set up the tables the other night, and they're all ready for us to sit and gather around together. The Hess family has provided uh, the, the juice and the bread for us to partake in a relational manner together. Now a question must arise, who can take communion? The Bible does not give us black and white answers on age or where we're at on our journey with Jesus. But if communion is a place where we are remembering Jesus and what he has done for us, it only makes sense that those of us who claim Jesus as Lord are the ones who partake in communion. So if you're here today and you're simply checking out Christianity, if you're a so-called seeker, someone who is seeking the truth but you don't, haven't committed to following Jesus yet, then we ask that during communion you do not receive the bread and the juice. You are more than welcome to join us in the fellowship hall, but as the bread and juice are passed around, please let those at your table know that, hey, I'm just not ready to participate in that yet. If you're not ready to take communion, then there's no judgment. There should be no judgment from anyone at that table that you're not ready. We're glad you're here, that you're seeking Jesus, and our hope is that you watch communion happen between brothers and sisters in Christ. Your desire to become a child of God would grow so that next time you would participate in communion.
If you're here from another church visiting today, you are more than welcome to join us in communion if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Just because you attend a different church does not mean you can't have communion with us. If you're part of the family of God through faith and obedience to Jesus, then you are welcome to join us for communion. As for the children, taking communion is, is up to the parents. Parents, do you think your children are at a place where they understand the sacrifice that Jesus made? Do you think they understand the brokenness of his body, the shedding of his blood for the new covenant? You know your children best. If you think they're ready to receive communion, by all means, let them practice, participate. But if not, as you're going around the table, just have the, have the bread and the wine skip over them, and if you're comfortable at the table when you're at there, pray. Lay your hands on the, the kids and pray. For, pray a blessing over them instead. When we get to the fellowship hall, Tracy and Jonathan will give us more specific instructions on how communion is going to work, and they'll actually lead by example. So to sum everything up, communion is about relationships. We want each one of you to feel connected to the people at your table. When you, when, as, you, as we share the elements, share the bread and the wine, we want you to feel connected because we all are connected through our faith in Jesus Christ, made possible by his broken body and blood that was shed on this cross. In between the sermon now, as we finish up and move to the fellowship hall, we're going to take a small break where you can use the restroom if you need. Um, you don't need to go wash your feet or anything or put on nylons because we're not doing that. <laughs> today, so don't worry about that. It is an opportunity, though, where parents, if your children are in the nursery, we're asking that you go down and grab your children. We want the nursery volunteers to be able to participate with us, and we also want uh, the kids to be there and experience church life. This is church life, um, so if, yeah, feel free to grab them, and then we'll um, just gather back in the fellowship hall there. There will be a screen in the fellowship hall that'll have words to guide us um, as we share the bread and wine with each other. On the screen, there will also be a reflection question for you to reflect on as you take communion, and then after we're done sharing the elements, Josh will lead us in a time of reflection as we reflect on, on the question of the day and how Jesus is part of our life. After everyone has yeah, given communion and that reflection time, Josh will then also lead us in a time of worship as we close the service. So again, once we get in the fellowship hall, Tracy and Jonathan are going to explain the details, so don't worry about that. Um, but as we get ready to transition, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that your blood was shed for a new covenant and that today, together as a family, we can remember your sacrifice. We can remember the time that you hung on a cross and made it possible for us to be in relationship with the Father. And so I ask that you just lead this time of communion, Father, that you help us to connect to you in, in, a, in a fresh way, a new way that we haven't maybe connected with you in a while. And I pray you also help us to um, connect with each other. As we, as, we, as we proceed to communion, God, I pray you convict our hearts of sin so that when we step from here to the fellowship hall, we can repent. And you'll, we know that in a moment you forgive us. So I ask that you'd stir that up, the sin in our heart, God, so we can repent of that. And I pray as we walk to the fellowship hall, if there is any animosity, any strife, any drama between brothers and sisters in our faith family, that they would just connect with each other and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? and restoration can be made. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, folks. <clears throat> Go ahead and um, we'll proceed to the fellowship hall, which is the, the room right out to the right here. And again,